Welcome to the NCLEX practice test for physiological adaptation. This practice test consists of 40 questions that cover a variety of topics related to physiological adaptation. Each question comes with a correct answer and detailed explanation to help you better understand the materials. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like the video and subscribe to our channel for more resources. Let's get started. 1. A nurse is providing care for a 49-year-old male patient who has been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. He is admitted to the unit after undergoing a bone marrow transplant and for continued monitoring for complications. His lab results reveal hemoglobin 7.2, HCT 25%, platelets 50,000, WBCs 5,000. Based on these lab results, the nurse must a. Remove all live plants and flowers from patient's room. b. Ensure all visitors wear masks. c. Monitor for occult bleeding. d. All of the above. Correct answer, d. All of the above. After interpretation of the lab results, the nurse should understand that the patient is experiencing pancytopenia. Therefore, the patient is at high risk of bleeding and infection. The nurse must remove all live plants slash flowers, ensure visitors wear masks and monitor for all signs and symptoms of bleeding. 2. A nurse is providing care for a 74-year-old female patient who has been admitted following a CVA. The patient has had an NG tube placed for nutrition and is NPO. She is alert, oriented to self only, lung sounds are diminished in the basis, and has left-sided paralysis secondary to her CVA. Her vital signs are as follows, T, 102.3, P, 98, R, 20, BP, 135-65, SP, 02-90% on room air. What should be the initial action performed by the nurse? A, stop the feeding. B, administer oxygen at 2 liters nasal cannula. C, suction the airway. D, all of the above. Correct answer, A. Stop the feeding. The nurse should initially stop the feeding to the patient with the understanding that aspiration pneumonia is a likely cause of the elevated temperature and diminished breath sounds. After the feeding is stopped, the physician should be notified because a chest x-ray may be needed. All other information provided is normal relative to the patient scenario. 3. Which of the following is classified as a prerenal condition that affects urinary elimination? A. Nephrotoxic medications. B. Pericardial tamponade. C. Neurogenic bladder. D. Polycystic kidney disease. Correct answer, B. Pericardial tamponade. A prerenal condition is that which causes reduced urinary elimination due to a diminished blood flow to the kidneys. A condition such as cardiac tamponade affects the heart's ability to pump adequate amounts of blood, thereby reducing blood flow to vital organs throughout the body, including the kidneys. 4. A client is having difficulties reading an educational pamphlet. He cannot find his glasses. In order to read the words, he must hold the pamphlet at arm's length, which allows him to read the information. Which vision deficit does this client most likely suffer from? A. Cataracts. B. Glaucoma. C. Astigmatism. D. Presbyopia. Correct answer, D. Presbyopia. Presbyopia is a condition that occurs when the lens of the eye loses accommodation and is unable to focus light on objects nearby. As a result, clients are unable to see or read items up close but may have success when holding the same item at arm's length. Many clients with presbyopia must wear bifocals, but long-distance vision remains unaffected. 5. A client with an enlarged prostate is having trouble starting his flow of urine when using the bathroom. Another name for this condition is A. Hesitancy B. Oliguria C. Retention D. Urgency Correct answer, A. Hesitancy 
Urinary hesitancy occurs when a client has difficulty with starting a flow of urine while using the bathroom. Hesitancy may be due to physiological factors, such as obstruction from an enlarged prostate, or due to psychological factors, such as anxiety or embarrassment. 6. Which of the following statements best describes substance P? A. Substance P decreases a client's sensitivity to pain. B. Substance P levels are drawn before administration of narcotic analgesics. C. Substance P is found in the brain and is responsible for pain control and management of depression. D. Substance P is found in the dorsal horn of the spinal column. Correct answer. D. Substance P is found in the dorsal horn of the spinal column. Substance P is a type of neurotransmitter that is found in the brain and the dorsal horn of the spinal column. Substance P may cause inflammation and edema, as well as pain. It may be associated with specific syndromes that produce pain for the client, including fibromyalgia or arthritis. 7. Preload refers to a. The volume of blood entering the left side of the heart. B. The volume of blood entering the right side of the heart. C. The pressure in the venous system that the heart must overcome to pump the blood. D. The pressure in the arterial system that the heart must overcome to pump the blood. Correct answer. B. The volume of blood entering the right side of the heart. Preload is the volume of blood that enters the right side of the heart. This volume stretches the fibers in the heart prior to contraction. Preload is commonly measured as atrial pressure. 8. The term, afferent nerve, means a. Carrying an impulse to the brain. b. Carrying an impulse away from the brain. c. Carrying impulses to the motor neurons of the appendicular muscles. d. None of the above. Correct answer, a carrying an impulse to the brain. Afferent nerves carry sensory signals to the brain. Efferent nerves carry motor signals from the brain. 9. The medical term, basophilia, refers to a. An attachment of the epithelial cells of the skin to a basement membrane. b. An overabundance of a particular white blood cell in the peripheral blood. c. An underrepresentation of basophils on a blood smear. D. None of the above. Correct answer. B. An overabundance of a particular white blood cell in the peripheral blood. Basophilia is an increased number of basophils in the peripheral blood. Basophilia is found in certain blood disorders such as leukemia and also in some types of allergic reactions. 10. A patient has been told to monitor her LH levels. Which of the following potential conditions might the patient be suffering from? A. Menorrhagia. B. Graves' disease. C. Menopause. D. Infertility. Correct answer, D. Infertility. Luteinizing hormone is released by the pituitary gland to stimulate ovulation. Women with infertility monitor LH levels to time intercourse to achieve conception. 11. A nurse is providing dismissal instructions for a child who was admitted for rotavirus. Which of the following statements by the parent indicates the need for further teaching? A. I'll start giving him his antibiotics as soon as we get home. B. I will call the physician if he becomes dizzy or overly fussy. C. He will need to wash his hands a lot to keep this from spreading. D. I'll watch to see when he stops having diarrhea stools. Correct answer. A. I'll start giving him his antibiotics as soon as we get home. A child who is being treated for rotavirus will need prevention of dehydration due to excessive diarrhea associated with the illness. Because rotavirus is a viral illness, antibiotics are ineffective as a form of treatment. The parent who is expecting antibiotics is misinformed as to the cause of the illness and the nurse needs to provide further teaching. 12. You are caring for a patient with newly diagnosed multiple sclerosis. Discharge instructions will likely include all of the following except a. PT referral for development of a planned exercise program. b. Avoidance of prolonged sun exposure. c. Hot baths to promote muscle relaxation. d. 
D. Instructions to evaluate the home environment to ensure safety. Correct answer. C. Hot baths to promote muscle relaxation. Excessive heat from sun or hot baths should be avoided since this can cause acute exacerbations of symptoms. The MS patient should begin to evaluate the home environment to ensure a safe environment as symptoms progress. 13. The BRAT diet is often prescribed for patients with gastroenteritis. This acronym stands for A. Bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. B. Bread, rice, apricots, and tapioca. C. Bananas, rolls, apricots, and toast. D. Bananas, rolls, applesauce, and tapioca. Correct answer, A. Bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. The brat diet should be started as soon as diarrhea subsides. This bland diet consists of banana, rice, applesauce, and toast. The diet is recommended for the low fiber and high potassium content that allows the patient's stools to firm while replacing nutrients lost to vomiting and diarrhea. 14. The family of a patient who is receiving therapeutic hypothermia states they do not understand why the patient is being kept so cold. What objective information can you provide to help address their concerns? Let them talk to another patient who has had the same therapy. B. Provide research-based information about therapeutic hypothermia. C. Connect them with the nurse manager. D. Call the physician and ask him to talk to the family. Correct answer. B. Provide research-based information about therapeutic hypothermia. Providing research-based information about the benefits of therapeutic hypothermia for their loved one will provide evidence that this is an established therapy with generally positive outcomes. Families are certainly not expected to be familiar with critical care interventions, and their concerns should be addressed with evidence-based data whenever possible. 15. Which of the following nursing interventions is appropriate for a client who is suffering from a fever? A. Avoid giving the client food. B. Increase the client's fluid volume. C. Provide oxygen. D. All of the above. Correct answer. B. Increase the client's fluid volume. Interventions for a client who is suffering from a fever include increasing the client's volume of fluid and providing oxygen. A fever increases the body's metabolism, causing the client to breath at a faster rate and increasing the work of the heart. The client is at risk of fluid loss due to increased respiration and sweating. In some cases, depending on the reason for the fever, the increased work of the heart requires more oxygen to maintain perfusion to the tissues. 16. A client has started sweating profusely due to intense heat. His overall fluid volume is low and he has developed electrolyte imbalance. This client is most likely suffering from a. Malignant hyperthermia. B. Heat exhaustion. C. Heat stroke. D. Heat cramps. Correct answer. B. Heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion occurs when a person has enough diaphoresis that he becomes dehydrated. Intense sweating can cause both fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Untreated heat exhaustion can lead to heat stroke, which results in organ damage loss of consciousness, or death. 17. Mr. N is a client who entered the hospital with a diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis. The nurse enters his room to check his vital signs and finds him breathing at a rate of 32 times per minute, his respirations are deep and regular. Which type of respiratory pattern is Mr. N most likely exhibiting? A. Kuzmal respirations. B. Shane Stokes respirations. C. By its respirations. D. Cluster breathing. Correct answer. A. Kuzmal respirations. Kuzmal respirations may be associated with some conditions such as metabolic acidosis. This type of breathing is actually a form of hyperventilation, resulting in increased buildup of carbon dioxide in the body. Kuzmal respirations are typically rapid, regular, and deep. 18. A nurse is assessing a client with right-sided heart failure. 
Which of the following symptoms would the nurse most likely see in this client? A. Weight loss and vomiting. B. Coughing and 3 plus pitting edema. C. Muscle cramps and hyperreflexia. D. Lethargy and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Correct answer. B. Coughing and 3 plus pitting edema. Right-sided heart failure, also called COR pulmonal, affects a client's abilities to breathe as the right side of the heart may have greater difficulty pumping blood toward the lungs. The client may develop symptoms of respiratory distress or coughing. Additionally, the feet and ankles may swell, resulting in pitting edema. 19. A nurse is educating a client about her cholesterol. Which of the following statements from the client indicates the need for further teaching? A. I would like my HDL levels to be over 50. B. It is better for me to have high HDL levels and low LDL levels. C. It is better for me to have high LDL levels and low HDL levels. D. My goal is to get my total cholesterol down below 200. Correct answer. C. It is better for me to have high LDL levels and low HDL levels. A client who states, it is better for me to have high LDL levels and low HDL levels, when talking about cholesterol indicates a need for further teaching. Low-density lipoproteins, LDL, contribute to atherosclerosis while high-density lipoproteins, HDL, can protect against heart disease. A client should understand that she needs to lower her levels of LDL while increasing her levels of HDL. 20. Which of the following situations might warrant a laboratory magnesium level? A. Hyperthyroidism. B. Arthritis. C. Ulcerative colitis. D. Depression. Correct answer. C. Ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis causes abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea, and weight loss for those clients suffering from this condition. The condition may affect how the body absorbs certain nutrients, such as magnesium. Clients admitted with chronic gastrointestinal conditions should be checked for electrolyte imbalances related to improper digestion. 21. A client with asthma is being admitted for breathing difficulties. His arterial blood gas results are pH 7.26, PCO 249, PAO 290, and HCO 321. Which of the following best describes this condition? A. Uncompensated respiratory acidosis. B. Compensated respiratory alkalosis. C. Uncompensated metabolic acidosis. D. Compensated metabolic alkalosis. Correct answer, A, uncompensated respiratory acidosis. Acidosis can occur in a client who is having breathing difficulties when the body retains excess CO2. The normal range of PCO2 from an arterial source is between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury. This client has an elevated level of PCO2 at 49 millimeters of mercury. Additionally, the pH should have a level between 7.35 and 7.45. This level of 7.26 indicates acidosis that is uncompensated because the body can no longer maintain an adequate level of pH to manage the elevated levels of PCO2. 22. Mrs. O is seen for follow-up after an episode of acute pancreatitis. Her physician orders a serum amylase level and the result is 200U-L. Which of the following is a potential cause of this result? A. The client is pregnant. B. The client has hypertension. C. The client is in renal failure. D. The client has pancreatitis. Correct answer. D. The client has pancreatitis. An elevated serum amylase level following pancreatitis may mean the client is experiencing another attack of the condition. Serum amylase may be ordered as part of routine follow-up after pancreatitis. Elevated levels may also mean other, related gastrointestinal conditions, such as cholecystitis or an intestinal blockage, so further testing should be performed on this client. 23. Which of the following situations warrants a measurement for orthostatic hypotension? 
A. A 36-year-old male with a spinal injury. B. An 86-year-old female with significantly altered mental status. C. A 58-year-old female with near syncope. D. A 41-year-old male with acute deep vein thrombosis. Correct answer. C. A 58-year-old female with near syncope. Orthostatic hypotension occurs when a client's blood pressure drops greater than 20 mm of mercury systolic when rising from a sitting or lying position to standing. Clients at greatest risk of orthostatic hypotension are those with syncope or near syncope, clients with symptomatic hypovolemia, and clients who are considered to be at risk for falls. 24. A nurse is caring for a client who has a sodium level of 126 milliequivalent slash L. Which of the following symptoms should the nurse expect to see with this client? A. Anystagmus. B. Orthostatic hypotension. C. Hallucinations. D. Dry skin. Correct answer. C. Hallucinations. A client with a sodium level of 126 milliequivalent slash L has significant hyponatremia. The nurse would expect to see mental status changes in this client that could include confusion, hallucinations, or coma. Hyponatremia may also manifest as headache, irritability, muscle weakness, or seizures. 25. A 58-year-old client is being tested for rheumatoid arthritis. Her physician orders an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR. Which of the following results is most likely to be associated with arthritis? A. 5 mm per hour. B. 12 mm per hour. C. 28 mm per hour. D. 40 mm per hour. Correct answer. D. 40 mm per hour. The erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR, measures levels of inflammation in the body. The results of the ESR may be higher than normal in clients suffering from some autoimmune conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis. A normal ESR for a woman above 50 is less than 30 mm per hour, therefore, a client of this age with rheumatoid arthritis may have a higher level, such as 40 mm per hour. 26. Which of the following statements best describes compartment syndrome? A. An injury causes pain and tingling that starts in the buttock and travels down the leg. B. An injury causes swelling within muscle tissue that leads to anoxia of nerves and muscles. C. An injury causes permanent flexion of the interphalangeal joint, resulting in deformity. D. An injury causes pain and swelling of the median plantar nerve. Correct answer. B. An injury causes swelling within muscle tissue that leads to anoxia of nerves and muscles. Swelling and pressure that increases within the muscle compartment is known as compartment syndrome. The condition may be related to an injury, such as application of a cast after a fracture. If left untreated, compartment syndrome can lead to decreased oxygen to the nerves and muscles of the affected area, causing necrosis. 27. Mrs. G is seen for follow-up after testing for chronically high blood glucose levels. Her physician diagnoses her with type 1 diabetes. Which of the following information is part of this client's education about this condition? A. Type 1 diabetes occurs from increased carbohydrate intake and decreased exercise. B. Type 1 diabetes is treated through diet and exercise. C. Type 1 diabetes occurs from destruction of beta cells in the pancreas. D. Type 1 diabetes results in the cells rejecting the body's insulin. Correct answer. C. Type 1 diabetes occurs from destruction of beta cells in the pancreas. Type 1 diabetes occurs when the beta cells in the pancreas are unable to produce enough insulin. Insulin is necessary to control glucose in the bloodstream and to help the body's cells utilize glucose for energy. Part of education about diabetes is differentiating the causes of each type so the client can be prepared for treatment. 28. Mrs. F has been diagnosed with hyperparathyroidism. Which of the following complications is Mrs. F at highest risk of developing? A. Hyponatremia. B. Hypocalcemia. 
C. Hypermagnesemia. D. Hypercalcemia. Correct answer, D. Hypercalcemia. The parathyroid glands are responsible for regulating calcium, vitamin D, and phosphorus in the body. A person diagnosed with hyperparathyroidism produces too much parathyroid hormone, which causes the body to remove excess calcium from the bones to be moved to the bloodstream. This results in elevated levels of blood calcium, or hypercalcemia. 29. A client has entered disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, after becoming extremely ill after surgery. Which of the following laboratory findings would the nurse expect to see with this client? A. Elevated fibrinogen level. B. Prolonged PT. C. Elevated platelet count. D. Depressed D-dimer level. Correct answer, B. Prolonged PT. A client who has entered DIC may have a prolonged prothrombin time, PT. The PT is a measure of how quickly blood can clot. A prolonged PT indicates that blood is clotting slowly, contributing to increased bleeding associated with DIC. 30. A client is admitted to a nursing unit with a remittent fever. Which statement best describes this pattern of fever? A. A persistent fever that has lasted over 24 hours. B. A fever that lasts two days followed by normal temperature for two days, followed by fever again. C. A fever that lasts two days followed by normal temperature for 12 hours, followed by fever again. D. A fever that spikes and then lowers without returning to normal. Correct answer. D. A fever that spikes and then lowers without returning to normal. A remittent fever occurs when a client has a high temperature that rises and falls. The temperature may be very high or may fall to a low-grade fever, but remittent fever does not return to normal temperature during fluctuations. 31. Which of the following components is associated with hypertonic dehydration? A. Plasma sodium levels between 130 and 150 milliequivalent slash L. B. Fluid moves from extracellular space to intracellular space. C. Water loss is greater than electrolyte loss. D. Physical signs and symptoms are grossly apparent. Correct answer. C. Water loss is greater than electrolyte loss. A person with hypertonic dehydration will lose more water than electrolytes, resulting in high concentrations of electrolytes in the body. Hypertonic dehydration involves plasma sodium levels above 150 milliequivalent slash L as fluid in the body moves from the extracellular space to the intracellular space. 32. Your patient has been diagnosed with herpes simplex virus 2. Which of the following would not be included in your teaching of this patient? A. If you have symptoms, you should avoid sexual contact with other individuals. B. With treatment, this condition can be cured. C. This disease is highly contagious. D. You may experience tingling in the skin before an active outbreak occurs. Correct answer. B. With treatment, this condition can be cured. Treatment for the herpes simplex virus, HSV is symptomatic and palliative rather than curative. This disease is extremely contagious and sexual contact should be avoided during active breakouts. Many patients do experience a tingling prodrome prior to an active outbreak of the disease. 33. Sinusitis is caused by a. f. Bacteria. b. Fungus. c. Virus. d. Any of the above. Correct answer, D, any of the above. Although typically caused by a bacterial infection that results from an upper respiratory tract infection, chronic sinusitis can also be caused by a virus or fungus. 34. A local sign of infection is which of the following? A. Swelling. B. Rapid pulse. C. Fever. D. High white blood count. Correct answer, it, swelling. The signs and symptoms of infection can be local and systemic, or body-wide and more diffuse. Some of the local signs of infection include swelling, heat, pain, 
and redness near the area. 35. A systemic sign of infection is underscore. A. Swelling. B. Redness. C. Heat. D. A lack of appetite. Correct answer. D. A lack of appetite. The signs and symptoms of infection can be local and systemic, or body-wide and more diffuse. Some of the systemic signs of infection include a loss of appetite, rapid pulse, fever, and a high white blood count. 36. A complication of osteoporosis is underscore. A. Rheumatoid arthritis. B. Gouty arthritis. C. Dorsal flexion. D. Joint deformity. Correct answer, D, joint deformity. Joint deformity is a complication of osteoporosis. Gout and rheumatoid arthritis are other types of arthritis. Dorsal flexion is not a complication of osteoporosis. It is part of the range of motion for the foot. 37. A nurse finds one of her clients unresponsive in his room. He is not breathing and does not have a pulse. After calling for help, what is the next action of the nurse? A. Administer two ventilations. B. Perform a head tilt, chin lift to open the airway. C. Begin chest compressions. D. Perform a jaw thrust to open the airway. Correct answer. C. Begin chest compressions. After finding a client unresponsive who is not breathing and who does not have a pulse, the nurse should call for help and immediately begin chest compressions. Chest compressions should be at a rate of at least 100 per minute, at a depth of at least 2 inches. 38. A nurse is caring for a client with severe mitral regurgitation and decreased cardiac output. The nurse assesses the client for mental status changes. What is the rationale for this intervention? A. Decreased cardiac output can cause hypoxia to the brain. B. Mental status changes may be a side effect of the client's medication. C. Mitral regurgitation is a complication associated with some neurological disorders. D. The client may be confused about his diagnosis. Correct answer. Decreased cardiac output can cause hypoxia to the brain. When assessing a client who has decreased cardiac output due to ineffective cardiac activity, the nurse should assess for mental changes. Diminished cardiac output could cause hypoxia of vital organs, including the brain, which can lead to mental confusion, restlessness, or lethargy. 39. Which of the following interventions must the nurse implement while a client is having a grand mal seizure? A. Open the jaw and place a bite block between the teeth. B. Try to place the client on his side. C. Restrain the client to prevent injury. D. Place pillows around the client. Correct answer. B. Try to place the client on his side. A grand mal seizure may place the client at risk of injury due to severe, involuntary muscle spasms and contractions. The nurse should avoid restraining the client or inserting objects into his mouth, as these actions may produce further injury. Instead, the nurse should try to position the client on his side to facilitate drainage of oral secretions and to assist with keeping the airway open. 40. You have measured the urinary output of your resident at the end of your 8-hour shift. The output is 25 ounces. You should do what next? A. Convert the number of ounces into CCS. B. Convert the number of ounces into CMS. C. Immediately report this poor output to the nurse. D. Know that 25 ounces of urine is too much in 8 hours. Correct answer. A. Convert the number of ounces into CCS. You have to mathematically convert the ounces into CCS because CCS is the unit of measurement that is used to record intake and output. This urinary output is within normal limits so there is no reason to immediately report it to the nurse. You must report urinary outputs of less than 30 cubic centimeters per hour. Congratulations! You have completed the test. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channels for more resources.